Um, my name is Beth Knorr, and I work for the Countryside Conservancy. And I want to welcome all of you to uh, this webinar with Chris Blanchard this evening on uh, 10 Simple Steps to Food sta Safety. Um, we are able to bring you these grants through a uh, specialty crop block grant through uh, the USDA and the state of Ohio. And we're, we're so glad that we're able to offer these. We will also be posting uh, the recorded session on our website uh, after, after we're all finished. Uh, so if you, if you miss anything that you'd like to go back to revisit, we'd encourage you to, to go ahead and, and check that out uh, at our website after the fact. Um, we're delighted to have Chris Blanchard with us this evening uh, sharing information on this important topic. Um, Chris works. Uh, is a farmer and works also has a consulting company called Flying Rutabaga Works. And he, he consults on a lot of different topics and also offers presentations on business planning, uh, effective marketing, post-harvest handling, and of course food safety. If any of you read Growing for Market, I'm sure you have seen some of his really informative articles in that fantastic publication. Um, if you have any questions throughout the, the presentation, uh, I would encourage you to go ahead and type those in. I will be monitoring them and um, asking Chris to answer those as we go. Um, some of them we may hold off to the, to the end of the, um, uh, the presentation to have him address, but we'll try to get to as many as we can throughout the session. Um, one final thing before I turn it over to Chris is there is a very, very brief survey at the end of the, the webinar. Uh, we would appreciate it very much if you took just a couple of seconds to fill that out. That really helps us with our uh, grant reporting, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, get another grant to continue to do these kinds of things. So Chris, thanks so much for, for joining us this evening, and I'm going to uh, turn it on over to you. Thank you, Beth. I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to, there we go. So we're uh, tonight we're talking about um, our 10 simple steps to safer produce. Uh, Beth did mention that, that we've, um, that I, I have a consulting company. It's Flying Rutabaga Works. We do a weekly newsletter that we publish it, um, uh, that, that, we, uh, that we publish uh, once a week. And you can sign up for that newsletter here. You can also read it on the, on the website at flyingrutabagaworks.com. So that's me. Um, I think you guys can can see me in the sidebar of your of your webinar. Uh, I don't look that relaxed very often, but there you go. Uh, that's Rock Spring Farm. We're up in northeast Iowa, so right up in the the northeast corner of the state, and uh, we're actually just a mile away from the Minnesota state line. So we like to call it South Southeast Minnesota, and uh, it's hilly country up here. We've got uh, we've we didn't get glaciated the last time that those things came south, so we've been going through a couple of extra thousand years of, of erosion. So we've, the area is really nice because it's it's tended to keep a it's kept a a, a lot of smaller farms uh, operating in the area, and you know, just because of the landscape, a lot of the tractors that they drive in places like Central Iowa, you just you can't even turn those around here in in Northeast Iowa in a lot of the fields. So. Uh, I've been farming since 1990. I got my start at Deep Springs College out in California, uh, California Nevada border. Uh, I went out there to, uh, you know, hoping that I was going to learn to be a cowboy, and and uh, and ended up working at the kitchen garden. Discovered I was afraid of cows, and uh, and decided that I would go ahead and, uh, well, I, I fell in love with vegetable farming and decided that that's how I was going to spend the rest of my life. And so I I went from there, worked on a lot of farms all over the country, got a lot of experience. I Me mean, back in the days when. Uh, it's kind of funny how far food safety has come. I, I worked on a farm that did salad mix production um, back in the early 90s that didn't have a hand washing sink and the bathroom facilities that were being used by the staff were, were an outhouse that was located 20 feet away from the packing shed. Worked on another farm doing, doing salad mix production uh, around that same time that, was, uh, that wasn't um, they didn't where they made their salad mix. They didn't even have a bathroom or a hand washing facility that was anywhere near. So, um, Rock Spring Farm. We've always focused on having stuff very clean, and and because of that, it's been um, it's been important to us that that we had um, 
but we're always using a lot of water. We're always doing a lot of a lot of intensive post harvest handling. So the food safety was always something that that really came to the fore for us. We did a lot of salad greens in our early years and spinach, uh, and we're selling that stuff bagged at farmers markets up in Rochester, Minnesota. So though that was something that we've always always had to pay attention to. We've done a lot of work with extended season here. Uh, the first thing we did on the farm was to put up some greenhouses when we bought the place in 1999. And our product focus has always been on, on what we call these upgraded basics. So these are really things that, you know, well, I'm the largest radicchio grower in the state of Iowa, but that means I sell about six cases of radicchio a year. And you're not going to make a living selling six cases of radicchio a year. So we've really focused on trying to grow things that people are used to eating, like onions, sun gold cherry, toma or cherry tomatoes, uh, winter squash, and um, and the... But when we when we do this, we're always looking for ways to actually make the product a little bit better or a little bit more appealing to our customers. So instead of just growing cherry tomatoes, we grow sun gold cherry tomatoes, which are, in my opinion, the best cherry tomato out there. Uh, when we do when we do squash, we're always har harvesting that squash extra ripe. Uh, it's meant again a lot of cleaning and a lot of handling. Our carrots don't they're they're not just clean; they glow and they're ready for they're really ready for people to take out of the box. And, and, and eat right away. So when we do that extra handling, we have to think a little bit harder about the whole food safety thing. Our slide says we grew the farm really fast uh, when we got started. Up until about four years ago, I did most of the work on the farm. I shouldn't say most of the work on the farm myself, but I was always involved in the day-to-day -day operations of doing the production, actually out there harvesting the crops, uh, doing the seeding, uh, working the greenhouse, doing the marketing. Um, we went through some changes in 2000, uh, 2007, 2008. We had some serious flooding here in northeast Iowa and southeast Minnesota. That uh, we had two 500-year floods in in less than less than a year, and then and then I got a divorce. That led that happened at the same time that I was doing more uh, work with the Moses Organic Farming Conference, and also being invited to come out to other people's farms and start to do some consulting. So I formalized that into this business of of, uh, of flying rutabaga works. But what, what was interesting is at the same time that I started talking to other farmers about, about what they were doing on their farms and, and how their systems were, were, were fitting together and how they could do that better, I was also finding that we had an increased need to make our systems better on our operation because we had, um, I was now working with a farm manager who was actually managing this production on a day-to-day -day basis. So the systems didn't just have to make sense to me. They actually had to make sense to my farm manager and they had to make enough sense to him that he could turn around and explain them and get other employees to fit into them. So it really kind of ramped us up in how we actually started to, to think about uh, thinking about our farm operations from a, from a more systematic perspective. So here we go. Okay, now we're going to jump into the, into the food safety thing. So, um, you know, I mentioned back in the early 90s, food safety was just wasn't much of a concern. Really, you know, you you knew that you weren't supposed to eat raw meat, but um, I mean, even even raw meat, I think, was was handled a lot more often than it is now. And um, the uh, it was having, I should say, handled a lot more cavalierly than it is now. And the um, in recent years, it's gotten a lot more attention. You know, fresh produce is the, it's really the last step before the, the consumer eats it. You know, when we're doing vegetable production, I mean, if you, if you do meat, presumably the customer is actually going to eat that meat before they, before they do something with it. If you're in the, if you're in the canned, canning pro, or processing market, you're selling stuff to a processing plant, they're cooking it, they're freezing it, they're doing other things to it that make it much more likely that, that you're going to have a kill step. Uh, with fresh produce, a lot of times there isn't a kill step between when we finish growing the produce and when our consumers are, are eating it. And scientists, you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't used to be really understood just how much food, foodborne illnesses are the result of, it's, they, they call it the fecal-oral route, right? It means that, that when you get sick, from when you get food poisoning, most of the time it's because you ate poop. You ate, you know, yeah, there were feces on your food, whether they're human feces or animal feces, that, that didn't get removed and didn't get killed in the preparation process, and now you've ingested those. And, and so you end up with those symptoms, the diarrhea and the vomiting, that end up 
turning around and taking what's on your insides, putting it on the outside so that somebody else can get somebody else's food and get infected. And then that's that's kind of this whole fecal oral route, right? So what comes out of you goes into somebody else. And that's why foodborne illnesses tend to have those kinds of symptoms because it makes it easy for them to spread. We've also discovered in recent years that that there's the infectious dose for a lot of these organisms is they used to think you had to go across a fairly high bar. Now you don't so much. Um, and, and some of that's because they found that the strains, I mean, a lot of the, the general strains actually do are infectious at a lower rate than what they thought. But you've also got some of these, these strains are getting more virulent, it's things like the, the E. coli uh, strain that makes people sick. And then the other thing is you've now got something somewhere between a quarter and a sixth of the population that is immunocompromised in some way or another. So, you know, that means that they're elderly, they're very young, they've had an organ transplant, they've got some sort of a disease that compromises their immune system, uh, usually a chronic disease that compromises their immune system. Uh, there's a, there are, you know, diabetics are immune compromised. So when you're selling produce at the farmer's market, you know, you have to look and go, well, gee, somewhere between one in four and one in six people that come up to my stand are at a much higher risk for getting a foodborne illness than than somebody who's got a healthy, robust system. Now, part of that, again, in the last 20 years, we've got a lot more, a lot of older people. People are living longer. There's a lower infant mortality rates, but we've also got a lot, and, and there's a lot more technology that are keeping people alive in ways that they weren't before, longer than they were before in situations where they weren't before, but now those people are operating with a, a less effective immune system. And, you know, when it comes right down to it, food safety is not just a, it's not just a legal responsibility, right? I mean, we've got the Food Safety Modernization Act that's that's coming down the path. Um, you know, you've also got the potential that, that I, you know, food that has foodborne illness organisms on it is considered to be adulterated by the FDA, so you know it's, it's illegal to sell that. But it's not just a legal responsibility, it's an ethical obligation to your customers. Of course, it's also good business, right? I mean, if you kill your customers, they don't tend to come back, and that's not really exactly where you want to be. But it's also an ethical obligation to the local foods community. And, and here's why. Um, in 2006, it's what they call the 9-11 the of the produce world. We had, uh, we had this when you have this, you have the spinach outbreak, right? We, this was happened in October. There was a, an outbreak. Um, the spinach was the, the the problems were quickly traced back to a plant in California. They tried to pin it on organics. It didn't turn out to be organics. But you know, there was this. It was one of the first times that fresh produce really had this huge monumental uh, multiple state outbreak, and everybody went into a panic about it. I don't know if other people remember this, but when, when I went into stores delivering my product in 2006, they had taken not just the spinach from the California growers off the shelves, but they had taken the Wisconsin growers' spinach off the shelves and the Minnesota growers' spinach was off the shelves, even though those weren't implicated at all in the disease. Grocery stores were taking everything off the shelves, and it wasn't just the large conventional grocery stores that were doing it. It was the small local food co-ops who have the kind of approach to where they should have known better and should have known that their, their growers were outside of the problems. These are highly educated people. They should have been able to figure this stuff out, but they didn't. And the, the result was we actually had a farm in, in, in Wisconsin here that went out of business shortly afterwards because of the cash flow hit that they, hit, they took because they relied on that fall crop of spinach to make things work in their operation, and they couldn't sell it. You know, and what's crazy about this is that when we start to analyze risk in this country, we're, we're really bad at it. In 2006, there were over 50 billion servings of fresh bagged salad greens that were, and spinach that were, that were purchased in the United States. And this one outbreak had 276 illnesses associated with it, and three people died. And the amazing thing about this is there was this huge panic, and now spinach sales what are we, seven years later, are still down. They've never gotten back up to pre-2006 levels. And you think about this and you, you realize what this implies for a local foods movement. If, you get a, if we get a foodborne illness outbreak that gets traced back to a local producer, and say that outbreak happens in the farm to school situation, then you're, you know, that's, that's going to be the end of farm to school. 
that, that program is simply going to cease to exist. And you could do a lot of damage to a CSA or a farmer's market or to local foods in general if, some, if we actually do have an outbreak and gets traced back. So I think it's something we all do need to be aware of. And of course, I go through this and I talk about, well, gee, it's obviously not very risky. I actually think you, you stand a better chance of dying from falling out of bed than you do of dying from a foodborne illness and here in the United States. But of course, we ask what risk is too much, and when it's your kid who's sick, that's, you know, that's when the risk is too much. So I do think it's being careful. And we have this myth that small farms are safer, and you hear this a lot in the, the alternative ag community, and the organic ag community, they'll say, well, you know, small farms are, are safer. And it's, it's not that small farms are safer. In fact, um, when the University of Minnesota did a study on this a couple years ago where they looked at conventional produce, certified organic produce, and, and non-certified organic produce. And they actually sampled it for the presence of fecal coliform bacteria. In other words, you know, the bacteria that's commonly found on feces. And they found that the, the, everything that they sampled from the conventional growers was clean. And everything they sampled from the certified organic growers was clean. But the stuff that they got from the non-certified organic growers, in other words, the smaller people, the folks that, that are less likely to, to go through the headaches and the expense of certifying organic, that's where they actually found contaminated product. And you know, the small farms don't show up because from a, epidemiologically, just because of a numbers game, the, the reach of a single outbreak at earthbound farms or, or Taylor Farms is going to get a lot more people sick than, than a single outbreak from a small farm. And that's what you need epidemiologically. You need a single outbreak. But there's no good accounting for, for farms that are out there serving just a few hundred people because you can't get at that uh, from a statistical standpoint. So we don't actually have any way to say small farms are, are necessarily safer. And you know the, the, a lot of times what this comes down to is an, is an ignorance issue. Now, we've, we've had a lot more education about this in recent years, but I talked to a food safety specialist here in Iowa a couple years back. And he told me he had recently been out to a farm the, where some of the members had actually complained about getting sick, and they thought maybe it was from the salad mix. He said, okay, well, where, you know, where, show me where you're washing your salad mix. And it was actually a grower who was washing her salad mix in pond water. And there were turtles in the pond water. You know, and turtles carry salmonella. In fact, lots of people get sick from turtles, pets, and stuff. And, and she just had no idea that she was doing anything wrong with that. And of course, the, the biggest the people that are almost the most at fault in smaller operations tend to be the owners. You know, there there is kind of this this attitude of, you know, well, I own the place. I don't have to follow the rules. And when we talk about food safety, it's it's just as important that everybody on the farm is paying attention to the food safety issues, not just the employees, but you know, just because you're the owner and just because you're coming in from the field and, and you want to, you know, you want to sample the salad mix out of the tank to see if it's in good enough condition to sell, you know, you can't be walking into the packing shed with your muddy boots and your unwashed hands and, and dipping into the tank and grabbing a leaf because you know that's going to put you in the position of being being the person who's spreading the disease. Now, when we talk food safety, a lot of times people make it really complicated. You know, there's all these rules that you have to follow and these record keeping forms that people say you have to do. But really it comes down to three essential things. You gotta keep the poop off the food. You have to know that you're going to get poop on the food. We grow food out in the real world, and so it, it is going to get contaminated. And so if you've got poop on the food, you need to keep the poop from spreading from one piece of food to another piece of food. And then you also have to keep the poop from growing. You, again, you assume that it's contaminated. You've got to hold stuff at the right temperatures so that you keep it from, from growing and expanding so that you've got more. Because, of course, you know, one one bacteria might not make you sick, but eight might, and so you want to keep that one from turning into two, into four, into eight, and then and then making somebody ill. So, the first and most important thing with with food safety is is to wash your hands. If you if you did nothing else, if you walked away, you came away from this talk, or if you if you decide that you're going to log off here in the next ten minutes, if you if you wash your hands and make sure that your employees have the facilities to do that. That's going to be the number one way that you can prevent contamination of your food. This is, you know, washing hands, right? You got to have some soap. Oh, 
Citation of the study. Okay, so I've got a, oh, I guess I'm reading the chat there. Beth will jump in if we've got a question. So, of course, when you wash your hands, you, it's, you actually need to use soap. Um, they've done studies on this, and, and when you, when you um, if, if you get your hands wet, but you don't use soap, you actually, you, it makes the microbes easier to transfer from one person's hands to the other person's hands, or from your hands to a doorknob, and then somebody else is going to pick it up there. So you, you actually, if you, if you don't use the soap and you just, just get water, you actually make it worse than if you had dry, contaminated hands. So you've got to use the soap to get the, to get the, get those microbes loosened up, and really get that dirt loosened up down in the cracks and crevices of your hand. You want to get your hands soapy. You want them to rub them together vigorously, palm to palm. Um, you want to get the backs of your hands getting down into your fingers. You want to, on the back of your hand, you notice how this person is using her, uh, she's using her fingers to scrub it. So that's actually getting that soap up into her, up underneath her fingernails. That's a, a real common place to have bacteria get caught up. Um, and then doing the same thing, getting in and really scrubbing all those cracks and crevices on your on the palm of your hand again, using your fingertips so that you're getting in, driving that soap up into your fingernails, and also then really getting, like I say, those cracks and those crevices because you get bacteria that get down in there, and a bacteria that's out in the open has all of its size exposed is is easy to rinse away, and but if if they're down in those cracks. You know, of course, that those are going to be the ones that are going to stick with you. So you really want to get down in there, rub those guys out of it there, and then you want to dry your hands afterwards. Now, I tried to find a good picture of using a single a single use towel for this, and a single use towel like we have in this sort of a, in this picture, you know, something that you're going to use once and throw away is really the ideal, because if you use a towel again and again, that means that somebody who doesn't do an adequate job of washing their hands, the guy that washes his hands but doesn't use the soap then uses the towel, now that towel is potentially contaminated. So if you dry your hands on a contaminated towel, you're going to end up with contaminated hands. So single-use towels are best. Use them once, throw them away. It is okay to use multi-use towels, another something like, something like this, but you can only use it once, and then it needs to get laundered. So you know, if you want to go out and invest in a whole stack of these, and you can get these pretty cheaply, uh, you can get a big stack of them, but you're just going to have to wash them before they get used a second time. We talked about dry hands. Uh, the, uh, a lot of people get confused about this, but antibacterial soap isn't necessary. It actually doesn't do any good um, over, over regular soap. So stick with the regular soap. Now, in our, in our situation on farms, hand sanitizers are also not particularly effective. And that's because we have a lot of organic matter on our hands and a lot of clay particles. In fact, those are the ones that are going to tend to stick on your hands even more than the silt or the sand that's in the soil. And those clays and that organic matter have so many bonding sites, the same thing that make them make them valuable agriculturally, makes it so that the it, it binds up the the uh, the sanitizers and keeps those sanitizers from being effective. So um, you, there's really no substitute on the farm for for using uh, for using soap and water and scrubbing vigorously for 20 seconds. Uh, now, you don't need hot water either. Modern soaps are just as effective in cold water as they are in hot water. But on our farm, we put in a small electric hot water heater. Our hand washing sink was located quite a ways away from the utility closet, so we actually put we put in this small electric hot water heater, so it's an instant water heater. Uh, and that way, as soon as somebody turns on the water at the sink, they're getting good warm water to wash their hands, because I didn't want to be watching people wadding, waiting for the water to get warm. And I also know that people who are washing their hands in 45 degree water, which is our temperature of our well water here, are not going to scrub their hands for a full 20 seconds underneath that water. This cost us about two hundred dollars. It was it was relatively inexpensive, and I think was a really good investment for us. Hand washing sink doesn't have to be fancy. I mean, here you've got one. 
I mean, this is this would be probably ideal if it was stainless steel. We went with a, I don't remember why we bought a porcelain one, but that's what we ended up with. You can see that it's got these um, it's got the paddles on the handles so that you can um, so that, so that, so that you can turn it off with your wrists or with the with your elbows after you're using it it's got a nice high neck so that that nobody's going to get their get that all soapy and icky so really this is this was designed for um you know as a as a hand washing faucet and as a hand washing sink but you know better than nothing uh is going to be to have something that you scrounge out of the barnyard and put together this is a this is on a large vegetable farm over in Wisconsin this is their this is their hand washing sink it's not ideal but it works uh, you'll notice that this is a hand washing sink it's there's nothing else here uh, once you use the sink for washing the food the the contaminated soil off of your hands then you have to assume that the sink is contaminated. So you wouldn't turn around and use that sink for washing equipment or for washing produce. Hand washing happens always happens in a separate dedicated sink. It doesn't happen where you're going to use where you're going to be handling produce or where you're going to be handling uh, ha handling equipment. This is another really simple hand wash sink here. It's got um, this is just a, it's got a garden shut off and a water breaker on a hose that's hanging down from the ceiling over a basin. So uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be fancy, and it certainly doesn't have to be expensive. Now, you'll notice that these guys aren't using single-use towels, and that's, you know, that's, that's less than ideal situation. You wash your hands. I think everybody knows this after you go to the bathroom, so after you've been smoking, because that's got your hands up near your mouth, and your mouth is a potential source of contamination, after you've been petting animals, uh, after you've been eating. And then... The most important thing is that you want to think about you want to wash your hands before you touch food or anything that touches food. So really, any time that you that you or your workers are coming into your into the packing shed, that's when hands should be being washed. And, you, and, and also, of course, before you go out to the field, you should be washing your hand, washing your hands. Uh, before you scrub crates out uh, or or harvest totes, that's going to be a time when you want to wash your hands. So really, before touching food, before touching anything that's going to touch the food. The second most important thing for, for food safety is to make sure that sick people don't work. Um, like we said earlier, vomiting and diarrhea are almost always the result of foodborne illnesses. Uh, this is how they this is how they transmit and this is how they get around. And you know, when people have vomiting, oh I'm supposed to say this first, it doesn't take much. I mean this is this is really the amazing thing uh, of with the with with how small of an amount of bacteria it takes or viruses to con to sicken everybody in the United States. Uh, you know this this one called rotavirus which is a fairly common source of the so-called stomach flu. Uh, it's quarter cup, and we can sicken everybody in the U.S. It just doesn't take that much. And vomiting and diarrhea are both explosive events. Um, the stuff comes out of your body. It's being it's being forced out and it comes out with such force that when it hits whatever surface it's going to hit it actually aerosolizes so it's it's turning into microscopic particles that are then small enough that they're floating around in the air just like if you were to use hairspray you know that the stuff kind of floats and it lingers and that's what happens with the particles from from vomiting and diarrhea what that means from a practical perspective is that it's all over the place if you've got a worker who has diarrhea, they've contaminated that entire bathroom. It's not just that they've contaminated themselves. Their clothes are going to be contaminated. The bathroom's contaminated. Anybody that comes in there is likely to contaminate. So it's not just a matter of keeping your employees from having diarrhea out in the field. It really is keeping them off of the workplace entirely. So we handle this at our farm through our our uh, our employee manual. Our employee employment agreement makes it clear that sick people don't work. Now, the side benefit of this, of course, is that it also keeps people from coming to work hungover. Uh, we just send them home because they're a food safety hazard. Uh, but it also does mean that you as the, as the farmer also need to be paying attention to this. If you're sick, you shouldn't be out there picking your produce. This is just a small step that, that people can take. Um, you know, again, don't enter this facility. If you've got any of these symptoms, and they go through some of the food, common food poisoning symptoms, 
reminder about washing your hands. You know, these sorts of things make a difference. Inspectors love this stuff, but it also is just a reminder along with some basic food safety training and orientation for your employees that if you're sick, you don't belong here. Third thing to do for food safety is to shut out the animals. In other words, keeping the animals away from the food as much as possible. This does mean domestic animals too. Um, the I know what my dog rolls in. Uh, I was actually just watching him roll in and out my window just a couple of minutes ago, and, and I don't want that in and around my produce. Okay. Um, we keep work to keep the deer out of our fields. Um, I, I, I never talk to anybody anywhere who doesn't have problems with deer. We've really been happy with this 3D deer fence that we got from from Premier, uh, so it's it's two strands on the inside, one strand on the outside, and it's, a, and it's an electrical fence. So the, the deer come up, they get confused about how far it is to jump over it, and then they touch the fence with their nose and they get a healthy shock. It does take a lot of work for maintenance, but it really does keep the deer out. You know, for maintenance, of course, you got to keep the grass off of an electric fence, or else you'll you'll drain everything out of it. And, and so we send somebody through with the weed whip. They basically walk down between the two wires. We do turn them off first. We're, we, we're not that mean to our employees. Uh, not providing a home for the winter critters. Um, you know, again, it's, you got to think about it. It's the, you know, you get mice in the wintertime. The mice carry diseases. The mice poop. But that poop is going to be hanging around when you start processing your food. You don't want those rodents to establish habits of being in your packing area either, because once they're there, you might throw them out, but they're going to come back again. So on this farm, they just this is an outdoor packing shed. It's just on a lean-to. They take their tanks, they turn them upside down, and put them up on their stands so that the, the rodents don't have a place underneath there to sneak in and hide. So you want to have nice high spaces underneath things, keeping things away from the walls so they don't have a spot to hide. Um, we talk a lot about the process of, of monitoring for pests, uh, seeing when you've got a problem. So we on our farm, we're using, um, and I, well, we, we keep a log here. I don't know if I, shoot, I don't have a picture of it. The, um, so we're, we're actually, we keep a bunch of traps around the farm. We're monitoring those traps every week. If we have a problem, then we set more traps and monitor more frequently in the places where we have a problem. And then if we consistently have problems, we look for ways to try to, to exclude our, our pests from that area. Um, this is just a, our, our log here that we keep when we check our, when we do find a problem in our, in our, uh, in one of our traps, if we found, find a, a mouse or find the, 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 the trap has been sprung, we'll come back, we describe the activity, but then we make sure that we're checking that trap every single day until we have 10 consecutive days with no activity, then it's then we, we take that hot spot off of the list. So that's how we keep it from being completely overwhelming. We're monitoring, and then when we do have a problem, then we move into active control mode. We have, um, we use these, uh, the, what they call them, like an automatic cat trap that's a repeating mouse trap. So it's a, it's a live trap. We get the ones that have the clear top on them. We have one in each of our coolers. We have one out in our in our packing area. We have one in our in our packaging room. And then we also keep one in the greenhouse. Now, the greenhouse isn't really a food handling place, but we actually have gotten a lot of benefits of being able to keep the rodent population under control there and made our, our transplant seeding go better by incorporating that into our regular process of checking those traps once a week all year round. We never get a population that establishes in there. Um, this farm, then this is the, the same one that was keeping the rodents out from underneath their tanks. They, they took the, um, they, they've got open rafters up at the top of this lean-to, so they stapled up bird netting. This is something they got, I think, from farm tech. I think it's relatively commonly available. It's just a, it's a plastic netting, and it's enough to keep the birds from getting up on top of those rafters underneath that, underneath that metal roof, underneath the stickers up there, and building their nests, because, of course, once you get a birds hanging around up there, then you get birds pooping up there, then you get poop on your food, all the problems that come from that. Um, we used to have a, a hoop house for a packing house, worked a very nice facility, but we, um, 
we did have a fly problem in there. We have a, a dairy farming neighbor. I mean, he's, he's quite a ways away, but we still do get a lot of flies in the summertime. We put up this ribbon, uh, and the, it's, a, it's a long, sticky ribbon, and it's, on a, it's attached to this. It's got this spool down here. And the um, of, of long, well, it's a spool of sticky tape, and you can see that there are just gobs and gobs of dead flies on there. So what once every, once that tape filled up, we'd move, we'd put all the food away first, of course, and then we would we'd actually add another spool at the other end of the of the house that was used for rolling that up. And so we would roll that up, and the the fly carcasses would crackle and pop. It sounded like a bowl of Rice Krispies, but it, it got them all cleaned out. It was a very effective way of of, of reducing our insect population there, since we weren't able to exclude them with screening from that facility. And of course, minimizing insect populations in the first place. You know, don't have your livestock grazing around your packing house area. You know, if, if you do have, you know, if you're using livestock to, to transport stuff, you know, if you've got a horse pulling a cart, when they get up to the packing shed, if they do their business there, you want to make sure that you remove the feces so that you're not not encouraging insect populations anywhere near where you're handling the food. And then securing and removing the waste. Now this is a, a fairly sophisticated way to doing it. This is called a, a dump bin or a materials dump bin. And it's a, they can pick this up with that forklift, drive it out to their, their compost pile, pull a pin, and it just tips and dumps itself out. Um, the, you know, what we use on our farm is a plastic wheelbarrow. So when we have compost that we're generating during the day, it goes in the plastic wheelbarrow at the end of every day. It goes out to the compost heap, which, again, is well away from the packing area. Um, but you don't want any food sitting around the packing area. You don't want to be encouraging rodents and birds to come in and, and check that. We want to secure it, and we want to get it away. Cleaning and sanitizing, of course, keeping things from getting um, I mean, we've talked about things getting contaminated directly out in the field, but then, you know, assuming again that things do get contaminated, there's dust, there's flies, there's, you know, I mean, there are rodents, uh, other things happen, so making sure that we're cleaning and sanitizing our equipment is very important. There's a really specific process that you want to go through for this. The first is you want to rinse the, the equipment off, so this would be, you know, when I say equipment, I'm talking tanks, I'm talking harvest totes, I'm talking barrel washers. Um, brush washers, rinse them off first. That's going to get rid of an initial layer of organic matter and debris. Then you're going to clean. You want to scrub. Here these arrows are pointing to the deposited soil, so you want to be, you know, using a detergent or you could also, I mean if you don't if it's not really dirty, you know, you could just use your elbow grease, right? Just get in there and rub that stuff, get in that deposited soil, loosen it up, rinse it again, so that's going to remove that deposited soil, and now you're down to the to the contacts, to the just the bacteria and stuff that are sitting on the contact surface. Usually if this, if you've done your job by this point, you're really dealing with, with a, a microscopic uh, layer of stuff, or, or you know, the in, individual bacteria, and then you're going to put the sanitizer on that. If you don't remove that dirt, like we said earlier about the hand washing, you know, in the presence of soil, in the presence of clay particles and in the presence of organic matter, most detergents are, are very quickly inactivated. They attach to those clay particles, they attach to that organic matter, and they're not going to do the job of attaching to the bacteria because a clay particle has got a lot more attachment points than a bacteria does. On our farm, we use Oxonia Active as our hard surface sanitizer. So for the sanitizer we use for sanitizing surfaces, this is a product that we get from Ecolab. I have a certified organic farm. This is a this is a product that is uh, approved for use on certified organic farms, and we get it from the same people that we get our water sanitizer from. Now, this is another place that we that where we want to use sanitizer, but a lot of people misunderstand how sanitizing wash water works. If you're putting bleach or now in this case, this is an acetic acid and hydrogen peroxide blend. They call it paracetic acid. You put this in the water. What that's doing is it's sanitizing the water. It's not sanitizing the produce itself. Okay. If you've got bacteria on the surface of the produce, it's it's gonna it's gonna kill that. But you know the surface of produce is all. I mean the leaves have all of these wrinkles and I use a fancy word like crenulations, but they're all it's all folded up and there are places for those bacteria to get into hide. Now this happens to be um, E. coli bacteria in the stoma 
of a leaf. So this is the this is where the the water and the the oxygen get vented out of the underside of the leaf on a plant. But those are bacteria. They're up in there. That you're um, if you're using a sanitizer, it's unlikely, first of all, that it's going to diffuse fully up into that stoma because the water that's there is going to be the water that's going to tend to stay there. But also, even if it does, it's not going to make full contact with that bacteria because there's all of these other things going on in there. See, there's this other stuff growing up in there, and it's protecting the corners of that. You know, you could imagine if you had a bacteria over here on the side that it's going to be kind of tucked into here, and and the sanitizers aren't going to get all over it. It's just going to get, it's just going to get a part of it, and, and it's not going to fully kill that bacteria. It might weaken it, but it's not going to kill it. And so then it's going to live and reproduce again. If you've got, if you've got feces on a piece of produce, you can't harvest that produce. Don't touch it. Don't bring it into the packing house because you can't take it off. Even if you brush it off, you've still got these bacteria. They're going to be, they're going to be hiding out down in. These in all of these crevices that that you've got in your plant surface. This is a nice stand that was put together. This is at Harmony Valley Farm over in Wisconsin. They this is where they keep their their sanitizers. They've invested in some things like like hand pumps there to make it easy to get the to get the sanitizer out. You'll notice they've got the measuring containers. They've got the squirt bottles for being able to wash wash down surfaces. So this is this is how they they put that together. We did the same thing with wooden crates on our farm. And I just want to point out this stuff is. Um, this is fairly acidic, and and down here at the bottom, you know, underneath this tank on the right hand side, we actually uh, dissolved some concrete. We weren't paying attention, and and somebody left that thing, left that spigot open, and it was just dripping there. And uh, as it dripped, it it burned a nice little hole in the concrete. So you want to watch. This stuff is this is very caustic, and you want to be you want to be careful with it. Um, of course, testing your water, making sure that you know that your water is safe to, to drink it. Um, I don't know what kind of a subsoil or a subsurface you've got in in uh, in Ohio, but here in Iowa, Northeast Iowa, we're all this. It's all un limestone and it's all fractured, and there's water flowing every which way, and it it doesn't follow any logical patterns. You know, just because water one way overland doesn't mean that's what it's doing underground, and so. And, and even you get down a couple hundred feet, you know, it's possible that you've got contamination coming into your well from places that you don't even know about, far away, um, you know, whatever. But you want to get that water tested and make sure that you're not washing your produce in in water that has been contaminated. Of course, it doesn't do any good to make all take all this effort to clean your produce if you've got if you've got uh, produce that has and you're washing it in in water that has fecal coliform bacteria in it. On our farm, we we uh, we test our water quarterly. Now we're producing and packing product year-round here, so quarterly is what we've been, what we've had recommended to us for that. If you're not washing produce in the winter time, obviously you don't need to you don't need to be testing your water in December if you're not packing out food in December. We, uh, in Iowa, we handle this through the university labs. Um, I don't know what I don't know the systems. I, every, every state seems to have a different system for for their for their water testing. But this should be the kind of thing if you get in touch with the sandy, the county sanitarian, they should be able to steer you in the right direction for inexpensive water testing. These cost us fifteen dollars once a quarter. Wearing the right clothes for for handling produce can be an important way of preventing contamination. Um. So shud, this is this is actually the food hygienist word for the combination of, of manure and crud that gets on your boots uh, when you're working in the barnyard. And again, you're out in the field. We we consider the soil by definition to be contaminated. Um, you you can't the the bacteria are microscopic. You can't necessarily see them when they're there. So we assume that that when we're when we bring mud into the packing shed that that mud and yes we grow our food in the mud and um, and I mean, it's out there and our ancestors eat it but you know when we bring that mud into the into the packing shed we have to assume that it's that it is that it is contaminated so wear, wearing wearing boots that are easy to rinse off rubber boots are great for this really smooth rubber boots the muck boots uh, that have become popular lately they're they're neoprene they're more they've got more insulation 
the surface that they have on them doesn't rinse as clean as something like a classic old-fashioned rubber boot, which really is going to clean off and, and can be sanitized quickly and easily, and, uh, and a 95% job done just with a hose. So you aren't bringing that stuff into the packing houses. Um, we really encourage our employees to wear aprons. Now, in this case, I'm wearing a, a, a pair of overall bibs. Here, these are these are a white plastic. They're Heli Hansen. I really like that brand. They're good, sturdy ones. I use the white ones in the packing shed because they look like a packing shed. They make it look like you're in a position to be handling food. And so the, the aprons do, do two things. I mean, it keeps dry as an employee, but it also keeps anything, any crud that I've gotten on my shirt from falling down then into the, the produce. So what you, what you don't want is to have, you know, if you've been petting the dog or holding the cat, and now you've got cat hair, and that cat hair is potentially contaminated. And even if you take the cat hair off, you've still got potentially bacteria and other dust that's in your the virus particles that are, that are on your clothes that when you lean over that water could potentially be falling into that water and contaminating that and the produce that's in it. So wearing an apron, now you can see clearly I've still got some surface of my, of my clothes that are exposed, but it's going to be reducing the amount of surface of my clothes that are likely to cause contamination. You'll notice that I'm wearing gloves here. That's actually not a food safety measure. Um, really gloves haven't been shown to in scientifically to increase food safety. If you put on gloves with dirty hands, now you just got dirty hands. You got you you soil the gloves. Now you got contaminated gloves, and you're still moving the contamination around. It. Gloves, if you're if you're going to use those on your farm, they actually do require a little bit of additional training to make those uh, an effective soup food safety tool. Most importantly, is that they need to be changed often, and you can't use them when they're worn out. Um, and in this case, it's to keep my hands dry. Uh, we still do need to be watching and sanitizing these gloves. Uh, and making sure that they're not transferring contamination from one employee's hands to the other. Because if I take my hands out of those gloves, you know, if, if, if somebody else was using them, their hands were contaminated. Now I put my hands in there. I take my hands out because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something with my bare hands, potentially not contaminating their produce with my bare hands. Of course, where we would last off, um, thinking again about clothes here, uh, you know, you go up, you feed, you water your sheep, and, you know, they rub up against you. and now all of a sudden you're contaminated, right? Your clothes have got manure on them. And you know, I the sheep, I use this example, they're they're you know, when they're out on lush green grass, you know, they, they do get the runs and you'll oftentimes see that their fur has been that they you know they actually defecate on each other when they're in a tight pack. And you know, again when, when that gets washed off, even if that gets clean, they look like they've got white white wool, they still got those manure particles on it. So you go up there and you start feeding the sheep or working around them with the water, they start rubbing up against you. Now you've got contaminated clothing. So you want to think about um, you know, either, either, either doing yourself or providing your employees you know, uh, coveralls, overalls, something that you can put on to cover up your clothes. Go work with the livestock, come out, change out of that stuff, and then go work with the produce. Or better yet, do the produce, then do the livestock. That would be the best thing to do. Of course, managing your manure is important. E. coli survives 260 days um, in the soil. So um, I mean, that's longer than the, than the organic certification requirements and, and would certainly say that, that um, you know, even, even something like you, know, you, you apply raw manure 120 days in advance, you've still potentially got issues. Now, the FSMA is, is going to be addressing this by, by trying to lengthen that out. I think they're talking in the, in the draft rule about a nine-month uh, rule for applying uh, raw manure to the fields before you grow produce in it or before you harvest produce from it. Um, you know, again, you know, thinking about um, thinking about having good equipment, um, you know, not using, I mean, if you, if you haul your, if you're putting compost on the field, and presumably that's, that's good clean stuff, doesn't have any foodborne uh, illness organisms in it. Now, if you go and haul raw manure and then you go put compost in there, now you, you know, you're potentially contaminating that compost. It doesn't take much to make things sick. Making sure you're applying your manure in a way that it's not going to contaminate produce. I mean, if you're if you've got two fields next to each other, you know, spreading raw manure and then getting a rain and having that rain wash the manure over the over the crop where 
over the field where you're growing produce, you know, that, that kind of defeats the purpose, right? Um, and even with compost, especially with farm-made compost, it's really difficult to get 100% uh, turning and, and incorporation so that really you get everything into the hottest part of the compost. I know even when we've gotten compost from, from our uh, commercial suppliers, a lot of times they'll bring in a semi-truck, they'll dump the stuff here, and that pile's going to heat up one more time. That means it's still got a lot of biological activity going on. There's still nitrogen that can be eaten up with it. And it means also that it's likely that there's stuff in there that hasn't been fully blended into the, into the compost pile. Even in a commercial setting, that happens. So you know, think about how, how different that is on the farm. Uh, when you, you know, if you're turning something like a, a front end loader. I'm a real big fan of trying to separate the functions between uh, different processes on the, in the farm. So um, we like to talk about having things move from being dirty to being clean. And we want it to be a nice linear flow. Okay? We don't want to have a bunch of dirty stuff next to the clean produce. Now here, this is actually a bad example. This is me washing. I had a my, my packing shed didn't really provide for this. We, we were using the hoop house. It had one door, uh, so the dirty produce and the clean produce were all coming in and out of the same relatively small area, and there wasn't a lot of space in there to line up all the dirty stuff at one end and have the clean stuff at the other. Um, so this is, this is less than ideal because I don't want to be handling that dirty product and then turning around and handling my clean product. So again, thinking about that idea that, that soil, by definition, is contaminated. So um, I mean, something like a barrel washer or a brush washer can be a nice tool because you put the dirty produce in at one end, it gets progressively cleaner as it moves through it, and when it comes out the other end, it's, it's clean. Um, so we like that good, that nice linear flow. We also like to separate the process of taking the dirt off of the produce from, from, from actually keeping the produce clean. So this is a picture of a packing house up at Featherstone Farm in southeast Minnesota. They have a very long, narrow packing room. And down at the far end, they're putting the they're putting dirty carrots into the washer. They're moving towards this end, and you can see how down here they're keep making an effort to keep the they're keeping boxes up out of the water, off of the floor. Um, the the boxes over on the right hand side that are that already have the liners in them, they're being kept up again off the floor on a on a food handling surface. Uh, things are going onto the pallet. Now this also has the additional advantage of uh, you don't want to be shipping out dirty boxes, right? That's just that's bad practice. But this guy's whole job is happening down here at the clean end. The guy that's up at the other end, his whole job is happening at the dirty end, and they don't mix. They don't they don't cross. You know, this guy the the guy at the clean end doesn't go and help the guy at the dirty end because he doesn't want to get contaminated and then come back to the to the clean end of the line and have dirt on his hands, dirt on his clothes, but then he's going to turn around and, and end up uh, potentially contaminating the, the produce that he's, that he's got uh, down there. Now, on our farm, uh, you know, we put up a new packing shed in 2006. We, we were actually right ahead of the, of the spinach debacle, and we, we put in a room just for packaging, and, and this is real, really common in the, you know, say in a meat, pot, meat packing plant where they will... Uh, you know, you, you kill the animal in one place, you gut them in that place to get the manure off of the animal and away from the animal, and then it gets moved to another part of the facility. Usually it goes through a door, goes through an open window, some sort of a constriction, and then that's where they're going to cut it up. So they're, they're getting it clean, getting the manure off in one place, keeping it clean in another place. And we use the same principle here. Outside of these doors, we're always working to get the, get the product clean. And then once we go through these doors, this is the place where we keep it clean. So this is where we're doing our bagging, uh, putting things in clamshells, whether it's herbs or salad greens or tomatoes. All of that happens through these doors so, so that we've, we've really separated the, the dirt removal process from the, from, the, from, the, uh, from the keeping it clean process. Now, we, we actually weren't looking at this from a food safety perspective at all. We kind of lucked into this one. Um, we, we just did it because we wanted to have a clean place to bag produce. Uh, you know, it's it's really difficult to to keep your salad greens clean or to do a good job of clamshelling herbs if you're hanging around in that same space, 
where somebody's running a pressure washer and then blasting dirt off of the carrots. Um, the other thing I note here is that we strategically place the hand washing sink right outside of those doors with the idea that people going in there need to be reminded, okay, we're, we're keeping it clean, now it's time to wash our hands again. You know, it doesn't do any good to put a hand wash sink at the back of the packing shed uh, where nobody goes. You want to get it in the flow of traffic through to where people are, you know, you go by the hand washing sink on your way to do your work. Um, you know, it's same idea here with, with having separate uh, separate items or separate containers for compost, uh, separate tool use for non-food work. So we took some some of our harvest totes, we use these plastic harvest totes, the ones that we're going to use for compost all got painted red. On our farm, red means that, that if something's red, you can use it on a non-food contact surface. So these are painted, these are painted red. We actually have red and orange for compost buckets, so we cheat and pretend that that's red. The brushes that we would use for doing something like cleaning the walls, that's a non-food contact surface. We're going to use a, we're going to use a red brush for cleaning the walls. Um, same thing with the shovels that we use for, for cleaning out, uh, you know, for scooping up mud off the floor, for cleaning out the trench. Those things should be marked in red so that we know that that's what they're for. We use then uh, blue brushes on our farm are used for uh, are used for keeping um, uh, blue is for things that for food contact surfaces so for cleaning out totes cleaning out tanks things like that and then uh, green is actually what we use for if, if we're cleaning produce with a brush green things can actually touch the produce so that's that's our color coding system that we use uh, yeah just another picture see that's compost right so that's we don't we that's it's not food anymore. Uh, and you'll see these totes are sitting on the floor. They're sitting on the floor because they're compost totes. I actually don't want my compost tote going on top of a pallet that's going to have something that's touching the food get placed on that pallet again later. So, you know, again, keeping things as, as separate as we possibly can. Now, this would get used until these compost totes are full. Then these are going to get taken out and dumped into that wheelbarrow again as, as soon as these fill up. And then that wheelbarrow is going to get run out to the out to the compost heap at the end of every day. You know the the um, I'm I'm never really convinced about this one. I have to admit, but they they say it's important it's having a recall system. Now, um, Chris, before you, know, you launch the, into this, can I can I interject with a question? You bet. So, what a uh, question from one of the uh, participants is uh, whether or not you're concerned at all about the exclusion from the Food Safety Modernization Act for small-scale producers, given the um, study that you cited earlier. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, well, look, if if um, <laughs> okay, do I am I talking with my activist hat on or my my food safety proponent hat on? <laughs> I, okay, so. I, First of all, I think that the whole food safety, um, the Food Safety Modernization Act is 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 laughable. We have such bigger fish to fry in this country, and anything that drives up the cost of fresh produce actually has a negative effect on the overall health of our population. And I hate to see that. Uh, I don't. I happen to be a fan of doing record keeping myself. It does me good in my in my consulting business. I teach people how to do this, but but it, I also don't want. Um, I mean. I don't want overburdensome record keeping, and and I and I don't think it I don't think it does anybody any favors. And um, but at the same time, if if we're going to say that fresh produce is so gosh darn dangerous, then why in the world would we exclude small growers from it, from 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 having to meet the requirements of the act? Um, I think it's more an enforcement issue than it is a, a more than, more than it is a, a an actual safety issue, and I think it actually I, to me it shows. I'd say as an activist, I think it shows that the whole food safety thing it's really a sham. I mean, again, let's go back. Fifty billion served in fifty billion servings of of spinach and salad mix served in in the fall in in two thousand six here in this country, and we end up with three people die, and we end up having to overhaul our food safety system because of that. It is more dangerous to get out of bed in the morning 
then you're more likely to slip and fall getting out of bed than you are to die from a foodborne illness. And if you go back and look at things like the listeria outbreak last year in the cantaloupes, person after person after person, I haven't looked at the entire list. I think there were 85 deaths from the listeria outbreak. That was a pretty, that was a bad one. Listeria is bad because it, it hangs around for a long time. Um, I think the incubation period on listeria is up to 90 days. So, you know, potentially you had, you know, if you had cantaloupe in the streams or people got sick, they didn't necessarily know that they were going to get sick for a very long time after that happened. But most of the vast majority of the people that died were over 85 or under 2. And not that those people don't have value, but they're people that their immune systems were already compromised. So it's not like we're make, taking healthy people and making them sick with our produce. We're taking people who are already not healthy. And, and those are the ones that are getting sick from these really exceptional outbreaks. They just aren't that widespread. And we get more people die from, from chicken contam from, from taking, you know, from cutting up a chicken in their kitchen and contaminating their own produce than you actually have from, from farm born and farm bred illnesses. Um, I don't know if that answers the question or not. I think it's silly that we're not requiring it from everybody, but I think it's ridiculous that we're requiring this from anybody. Um, the idea that we gave the FDA authority over, over fresh produce, I mean, could you ask for a bigger regulatory nightmare? These people aren't farmers. They don't know what they're talking about. And, you know, I think we've, just, we've really set ourselves up for a mess. On the other hand, this is what we got. The legislation's been passed. The president signed it into law. And now we've got the regulations. So the rules out there, I do encourage everybody who has time to read the rule. If you don't have time, read the commentary on the rule and get your comments in. Comments are open until May 15th, I believe. And the great thing is the FDA is required by law to respond to every comment. They don't necessarily have to respond to you, but they do have to address it in the rulemaking process. And Organics changed the nature of the organic rule that the USDA had put out back in 1999, and I think we need to we do need to look at doing that again with the FDA rule. And there needs to be um, a lot of focused attention on that. And I know everybody's busy in the greenhouse right now, but um, it is something that I think uh, we need to be really aware of. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I think I think that was a good answer. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, it makes me rant. Um, and the recall system, I, I guess it, it isn't, it's actually a nice segue here into this idea of a recall system because everybody's really concerned with you. You, know, you have to know the day and the field from which your product was harvested, and you have to know exactly who it was sold to. I mean, the reality is if my food makes somebody sick on a farm my size, I'm taking everything I got off the shelves. And I'm probably going to be out of business anyways because somebody's going to sue me, and I don't care how much liability insurance I have. Farm Bureau is going to do everything they can to get out of paying it. And once we get done, even if I've got a one million dollar liability uh, package, you kill a couple of people with a food board, food safety outbreak, that million dollars isn't going to get you very far. So, you know, it really is. I mean, I think there's kind of a balancing act with this recall system. The most important piece here is is the any produce that you sell to somebody who's not a retail customer, okay? In other words, if you're if you're at farmers market, I don't feel like you need to have this kind of labeling on your on your product. But for a lot of times, it would be completely impractical. But if you're selling to a store or to a restaurant or to a wholesale distributor, you do need to make sure that your product is leaving your farm with a label that has, at a minimum, your farm name, your address your phone number, and if you have one, your website, so that if there is a problem, people can get back in touch with you. Um, of course, a label is a nice thing. You want to build your brand. You want to be proud of your product. You want to make sure you're getting that out there uh, in the marketplace. Uh, we label ours with a, with a lot code. Um, and this is actually this is a, an old lot code that we used to use. We have a, we have a system now that we've, that we've gone to. The lot code is just a way of tracking your product um, you know, through the chain of handling. So for us, it's a way that we, we, we can look at the lot code, and that tells us that the information about doing that packing was recorded on a certain piece of paper. We can look on that piece of paper, and, and that'll tell us where the product was harvested, or we'll link back to the, 
the harvest records. So it's just a way of, of establishing that paper trail and tying things, tying one piece of paper to another with a number. Um, hope that makes sense. I didn't, I didn't do a big lot coding example for, for what we're doing today here. Uh, but that this is going to be a requirement under the FISMA. And I actually, it, it's my understanding that, that the FISMA, the part that people are exempted from is the inspection part. Um, you still are supposed to be following the rules. You're supposed to be doing good food handling. And one of the things the FDA is going to consider to be good food handling is that you can trace your product one step forward to the customer who bought it from you and one step back to the field and the day on which it was harvested. And, and if you are suspected in a, food, in a food safety outbreak, then the FDA can, come, can still come in and you know, shut you down and impound your produce or inspect your facility. And at that point, you do become subject to the FISMA from that point going forward once they even suspect that you've been involved in an outbreak. At least that's how the draft rule reads. And I'm going to be surprised if that, if that changes at all. Um, harvest logs, I do a lot of workshops on record keeping. Um, we've got a really good system here at Rock Spring Farm. It doesn't have to be something that you you know, generate in Word and, and, and photocopy. This is something that, that's used at a, at a farm that grosses over a million dollars a year in sales. Their harvest log is still just a, a photocopied thing that they whipped up with Sharpies. Uh, so it's, don't, don't feel like you have to go overboard on, on what you're doing with, with, uh, with, with actually making everything pretty and perfect. Uh, you know, good enough is good enough in this situation. Being able to track the stuff back is what matters, not necessarily how it looks. The tenth thing, the number ten step for for uh, food safety, the last one that we've got really is washing your hands again. And I just you, you can't emphasize this enough uh, how important the hand washing is for for food safety. Um, we handle the produce with our hands. We handle everything else with our hands. So they're not only are the part they the part of our our body other than other than where the stuff comes out that's the most likely to be contaminated. It's it's also the part of your body that's the most likely to be handling the produce and to come in contact with it. So if there's one thing you do, it's, it's, it's washing your hands, soap and water, okay, for 20 seconds and then using a single-use towel or using a towel just one time and then washing it because um, drying your hands is, is, is just as important as, as getting them washed and, and then you're good to go. So that's the food safety rant. Um, that's what we got, and uh, so it's. I see it's seven ten. So I think I think we've got some time to to do questions if if people have them. I hope that we've I, mean, I hope we've covered a lot of material. So there aren't a whole lot of them out there, but I also hope that we've set it up things that we have raised some questions for folks. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to type those in now, so we can uh, have Chris address some of them. Um, So I, I do have a question. Aside from hosing off your boots and that kind of thing before you come into the packing shed, Chris, what other kinds of things like that before you come into the packing shed do you do? Do you do anything else in particular? Nope. I mean, again, washing your hands is, is I think, the, mo the, the other really important thing. I mean, I've said that before. Um, I mean, even your boots, I mean, if if we if we think if we if we're going to treat the soil as being contaminated, we're kind of going to treat the floor as contaminated. You know, the the um, food falls on the floor. If it's been washed, it's contaminated and it goes out the door. At that point, it's 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 compost. Okay, uh, because we assume that even if you rinse off your boots, you're bringing in soil on them. Again, aprons can be another additional step. Um, I like to see workers in the packing area wearing aprons. It keeps them dry. It reminds them that they're working with food. Um, I think some of those mental things that you can do that, that tell people to remind them that they're not just out there like being, hey, you know, like it's all good and I'm growing food and I'm feeding people. You know, it's like, okay, we're, we're here. We're handling food. People are going to eat this stuff and we got to keep it clean. Um, so kind of trying to think about some of that costuming stuff as being a, a you know an attitude adjustment. Now sometimes for me as a manager, I end up going into the packing house to address issues when I haven't 
wash my hands and I, you know, I'm going to be turning around and going right back out again, uh, one of the tricks that I use is to just put my hands behind my back when I walk in. If I, if, I, if I haven't washed them, I'll stick my hands behind my back, go and talk to the person I need to talk to and leave again. But not letting my hands get in front of me means that I'm never going to be tempted to pick something up or touch anything uh, that, that, that could potentially cause a contamination issue with my unwashed hands. So have you, in, in terms of uh, washing and rinsing practices, do you, do, do you focus more on rinsing with running water, or do you do any dunking type of rinsing in, in a tub situation, or what are your thoughts on that kind of thing? Um, so so when, if you're talking about for, for actually for handling the produce? Right, for like rinsing yeah. it off and that kind of thing. So it, it depends on the crop, and it depends on how much soil we're dealing with. Almost, you know, every leafy green on my farm, when it comes in from the field, it goes into a tank of water. Um, so we're going we're gonna to dump it out of the container that it's in into a large, a large tank of, of water. And then, um, and then from that tank, it's going to get so that t the water in that tank is going to get a wash water sanitizer. So that's that that tsunami product that we buy from mm -hmm. EcoLab. Um, a lot of conventional growers just use use straight food grade Clorox bleach. You can't use like the scented Clorox bleach. You'll be trying to make your salad mix taste like lemon. Okay, uh, use the food grade stuff. Um, and that's going to keep any, any contamination from spreading from one piece of produce to another. From a food safety perspective, dunking your produce is about the worst possible thing you can do. Okay, because you're taking so so if you, you let's let's take broccoli for example. You know, I see I see bird poop on broccoli all the time, right? So if you bring in a head of broccoli that's got a bird poop on it and you got another hundred heads of broccoli and you dump all of those into the same tank of water, that poop's gonna dissolve and that those bacteria are potentially going to contaminate all 100 heads of broccoli. Uh, whereas if you, you know, if you, if you never put it those into a tank of water, if you cooled it down some other way through forced air cooling or with ice, you would, you'd be able to avoid, you, you'd be avoiding that, that con having that one head of broccoli contaminate the rest of the heads of broccoli. But practically, on a farm that's my scale, uh, I don't have an ice machine. We don't. I, forced air cooling is not really what I need, and and I need I need that humidity. I need that wet, uh, that that wet cold that's going to suck the heat out of the crop uh, from a post harvest handling standpoint. So I'm willing to I'm willing to take that risk. But I use a wash water sanitizer and I test my water. Uh, if I'm using doing a crop like melons or tomatoes or peppers, those are going to get sprayed off rather than getting dunked in the water because when you take a if you if you have a warm like a warm melon or a warm tomato or a warm pepper and you dunk that into cold water the there's actually the potential because of the the the, the temperature differential there there's the potential for water to get sucked inside of the of the fruit um, and it can get either sucked in through the blossom scar or it can also get sucked in through the stem scar and and then it'll actually end up inside of that fruiting crop uh, so those, that's something where we are a little bit more careful, and we do hose those things off or, or scrub them outside of, the, outside of going through a tank of water. Okay. Uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in here. Um, one person says you, that you mentioned, you know, keeping the fecal matter from growing or spreading. And what about temperature and with regards to handling it? Um, and are packages such as clamshells a uh, uh, part of the way that you can help protect cr from cross contamination. Right. Um, so the first one, temperature is is a really important element. The rate of the rate of bacterial activity roughly doubles for every ten degrees increase in temperature. So if you're holding produce at at um, at fifty two degrees, well here let's let's do the normal progression. So if you're holding produce at thirty two at forty two degrees, the bacteria is going to grow on that twice as fast as it is on produce that you're holding at thirty two degrees. And if you're holding produce at fifty two degrees, it's going to be growing twice as fast as it is on pro or twice as fast as as it does at forty two degrees, which is four times now as fast as it's going to at thirty two degrees. So Keeping produce, storing it at the right temperature is a really important tool for, for farmers to, to, to 
mitigate the food safety risks. But obviously there are some crops that you don't want to store that cold, right? You don't want your tomatoes down at 35 degrees. You're going to ruin the flavor of them. So that's, that's a balancing act there. Uh, as far as putting things in clamshells, it's less an issue of cross-contamination because that, you know, having, if you've got a bunch of, of dry stuff, remember we talked about how your, your dry, dirty hands are less likely to spread contamination than, than wet, dirty hands. So um, it's, it's not really much of an issue once you get to the point of putting things in clamshells of, of avoiding cross-contamination. Where you're really going to make a difference is that, um, is that now you've got the, the consumer isn't going to be handling them with potentially contaminated hands, okay? Because what, what you, I think this is probably one of the bigger risks that you've got out there is that you've got some snotty-nosed kid who's been, or a mom who's just changed a diaper or, you know, or you name it, um, in the, somebody that didn't do an adequate job of washing their hands in the grocery store, and now they're handling your produce, you know, picking it up, turning it over, looking at it, and now stuff that, that you delivered perfectly clean to the store is now contaminated. So having stuff in clamshells certainly helps with that. Well, and another, that's a nice segue talking about customers handling the produce. Another question is, you know, how do you feel about um, customers who are using their cloth bags at the farmer's market? And, and do you see that as being a concern because, you know, we can go through all these steps of trying to protect our produce, but we don't really have any control over what's been in their bag or what they're putting your produce in with or up against and all that kind of stuff. Right. It's one of my it's one of my favorite um, it's one of my favorite affirmations is you know all I can do is all I can do and what I've got control over is is what happens to the produce on my farm once it once it goes in somebody's bag I I can't do anything about that um, so that's that that's the customer's risk and um, you know there's yeah that's a that's a potential it's a potential food safety hazard um, on the other hand I'm I mean. I use cloth bags every time I go to the grocery store. I, I probably, you know, yeah, I'm probably recontaminating my stuff. But that doesn't affect anybody else. As a, as a customer, right. it only affects me. And if we want to think about this from a from a food safety outbreak standpoint, from a from what we'd call a public health standpoint, because that's what I mean. That's what food safety is, right? I've got the potential as a farmer to make a whole bunch of people sick. It's really I'm not worried about somebody eating the one piece of broccoli that the one sick bird pooped on. Okay? The the chances there are so small that something's gonna happen. Um, you know, and it's not going to result in an outbreak. I'm not going to make hundreds of people sick that way. But if I take that broccoli now and I spread that poop around to all of the broccoli that I'm selling, now there's a good chance that a bunch of people are going to get sick. And that's where you end up, that's that's the public safety aspect of it is you've got a lot of people potentially being harmed by a product. Um, where whereas somebody who's putting it in their own bag, they're just doing their own thing. Well, does anybody else have any other questions? I don't see many rolling in at this point. I think the presentation was was very clear and, and pretty straightforward and I appreciate that kind of uh, uh, pragmatic information, Chris. Um, so if Thank we don't you, have any other questions, I, I don't know if you have any final comments or anything. Boy, I wasn't I wasn't prepared for final comments. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess you know my, my I well it would be to make, just make another pitch. I mean the the fact that you're here attending a, a a workshop about food safety on a on a Thursday night in the spring means that you you clearly have some interest in this. Uh, Maybe you're concerned about the regulations. Maybe it's just something you realize is coming down the pike. But I do think that that activism around the Food Safety Modernization Act is going to be really important. Uh, you know, paying attention to what's happening and what your industry papers are saying about that. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to sit down and read the 500 or 900 page rule yourself. Uh, but but getting somebody who who your organization that you trust to to help you understand what's going on and and then making sure you're getting in contact with the FDA about that submitting your comments on uh, I think that's that's the only way that we're going to get a rule that actually works for us as as small diversified vegetable growers. Okay, well. I, I don't personally have any other questions, and we, we don't have any, anybody else 
closing okay. just any right now. So I want to thank you so much for your time, Chris. I thought I think it was a great presentation, very informative, and. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, before we began, we will post the link to the webinar recording on our website. And again, I'll put in another plug. Please just take a couple of minutes, a very, very brief survey at the end of the uh, presentation. If you wouldn't mind taking just a few moments to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. So thanks, Chris, for, for joining us. And actually, Chris will be joining us again in April, April 24th, um, for another webinar. Um, on how to calculate prices for for your your products, so join us for that uh, as well. Thanks Great. so much, Chris. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Okay. Good night. Good night.